going to be uh, continuing the sermon, the series that we've been working through in the last, well, this last week and la- last week and then this week. Um, I got to make sure this stuff doesn't fly away on me here. And we're talking about heaven in the last, last Sunday. We talked about what's your body going to look like when you get there. Is there going to be any more pain? Is, there, is it going to look the same? Will people know who you are? If you uh, want to hear more about that, you missed last week's message, we encourage you to go to our website and check it out and catch up with the series. But today we're going to be talking about what happens when you get to the pearly gates. How many of you know where that phrase comes from? Anybody think they know where the term pearly gates comes from? I don't see any hands up. Revelation. Oh, there's a good one. Yes, from the book of Revelations, the holy city descends on earth. We're at chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And the Bible says that there are 12 gates, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And each gate is made out of one pearl. Can you imagine how beautiful that must look? That there are gold and diamonds and sapphires that make up the holy city. This is obviously a metaphor for the beauty of what God is going to provide for us when we get there, right? But many of us, we've got no clue what heaven looks like. Nobody does. And Jesus is the only person that we can look to for some advice about what's going to happen when we get to the gates of heaven. What's it going to be like when you stand before the gates? Is is God going to throw open the door for you? Is he going to say, hey, your name is in the book? Because the Bible says that God is going to look in the book, he's going to open the pages, and he's going to see if your name is written there. Your name. And whether you have uh, lived out this life being responsible, uh, being a follower of his, he's going to find out, everyone is going to hear your life. And whether or not uh, you follow Jesus or not, it'll be plain in the book. It'll, it'll say, look, there's, there's, your name is here, but Jesus has paid for all of the wrongs that you've done when you get to the gates of heaven. But the problem is, and as much as I would uh, like to not talk about it, there is also the reality of hell. I, I think that I can count on one hand how many times I've actually talked about hell in a sermon. And I don't think that it's, it's very easy to do. I mean, as soon as I said it, a lot of you cringed. <laughs> you, pro- you probably thought, oh no, this is like a fire and brimstone sermon coming up. And this, this is not it at all. Uh, but one of the things that we've got to be careful about is that we know the big picture. Because if we don't know the big picture, we don't know what's coming, then we're not well prepared. And if I want to tell you what heaven is like, I've also got to tell you what the opposite is like. What it's like when someone goes to hell. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of those details. Jesus said it way better than I did. But at least I want to tell you this. First of all, from Revelation chapter 21, verse 10, it says this. Then the devil who had deceived them, that's us, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night for forever. How many of you uh, want to know that the devil is going to hell because of what he's put you through? Yeah? The devil has put you through a lot. Whether he's whispering in your ear and you decided to listen to him and follow that advice. Or whether he influenced someone else in your life and caused you a lot of pain and anxiety. We all want to know that the devil is going to get what he deserves. Can I get an amen? Amen. We all want to know that there's justice for those people who have suffered because of what evil has happened in the world. Any of you want to see someone get justice for what they have done? You know what? We're supposed to be loving and forgiving and kind as Christians, which is absolutely true. But when you've been hurt that way and you cry out to Jesus in your pain, and you stand before the gates of heaven, you want to know that there is punishment for someone who has caused such evil and harm in the world. My mother, uh, when we were bad at home, she uh, got out the wooden spoon. Anybody have a mom like that? Yeah? Dads, sometimes it was the woodshed. You got to go to the woodshed. Now, they don't do that anymore, and I'm glad that they don't. So I'm not advocating corporal punishment at all. But when I was a kid and my mom grabbed the wooden spoon, I knew that I was in trouble. 
And she came around because my dad wasn't home and it was the best leverage that she could get. And it also convinced me that I needed to behave. As a matter of fact, I think my mom only used it once. And by the way, she broke it when she used it. I think my mom only used it once. But every time she reached into the drawer, I needed to know that she was willing to use it. But that was often enough, right? My mom loved me. My mom and dad loved me. But I needed to know that there was a punishment for some of the bad decisions that I make. If I was disrespectful, if I broke things, if I was being bad, I needed to know that there was someone there who was going to hold me accountable for all of the things that I'd done wrong. And when we're standing before heaven, the gates of heaven, God is going to open up the book. And he's going to be asking each one of us a question. Who do you believe in? Whose kingdom do you believe in? Jesus also wanted us to know something about the devil and the work of the devil because he also doesn't want us to be surprised. Knowledge is power. When you understand how the world works, how things happen behind the scenes in the world, and I think that all of you can agree that there is a spiritual side to this world, right? And if there's good, there has to be evil, we can't say that there's only good in the world because then there wouldn't actually be good. We need evil in order to compare it, in order to say, well, that is good and that's evil. We all know what's bad, and we don't need the Bible to tell us most of the time what it is. And the evil in this world wants to mess with you. And Jesus looked at one of his disciples, his, his disciple named Simon Peter. And he said this to him just before he went to the cross. Maybe some of you remember what Simon Peter did when Jesus was taken captive and he was tortured before he went to the cross. Peter kind of put some distance between him and Jesus and said, I, I don't know that guy. I, he's, I don't want to get into trouble. I don't want to get involved in what he's getting involved in, but I can't walk away. He would put some distance between him and Jesus. And finally, Jesus predicted this before he died. He said, when the rooster crows, you're going to realize that you've denied me three times. And just before this happens, Jesus says to him these words, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked me to sift you like wheat. Uh, many of us, we don't understand what that kind of phrase means. It was kind of a, a metaphor, right? It kind of, if I was to put it in layman's terms, Jesus is looking at Simon and said, Simon, the devil's going to slap you on the ground like you slap wheat on the ground. He's going to slap you around. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon. And then he says, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and returned to me again, strengthen your brothers. That is so comforting to know that the devil's got to ask permission, that everything is still under God's control. Now, some of you say, well, that's not fair that God lets the devil mess around with us. Why is there, why, why would a good God send people to hell? Well, I want to tell you this. I think that that's a misinterpretation of, of who God is. God is a loving God, a God who loves and cares for us. He doesn't send anybody to hell. We choose. You and I have a choice. Maybe some of you are kind of sitting here today going, oh man, I came on the wrong Sunday. Is this minister's talking about hell? But we all have to choose. God doesn't send us anywhere. He doesn't send us to heaven. He doesn't send us to hell. He gives us the choice. He says, you are smart enough. You are wise enough. You have the decision-making power. I lay the options before you. You choose. And there has to be a place of hell if there's a place in heaven. Because if there's no hell, then what's the point of heaven? C.S. Lewis said this. He said, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than hell if I lay it in my power. I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully that everyone would be saved. If there is no hell, God is not just. If there is no punishment of sin, heaven is just pathetic and apathetic towards all those people who have been raped or murdered and mass murders of society. If there is no hell, then God is blind to the victims. And he's turned his back on those who pray for relief. 
if there is no wrath towards hell, then God is not love. For love hates that which is evil. If you want to know about heaven, you've got to know that hell exists. Because when we stand before the gates of heaven, we've got to know that God is going to let us in. You know, there are a lot of jokes about St. Peter at the pearly gates of heaven. Imagine that many of you could probably tell a few of those. You know, there was this guy and that guy, and they were standing at the gates of heaven, and they said, hey, St. Peter, whatever it is, and something happens, and it's funny. Well, I want to tell you a joke. There's two guys standing at the pearly gates. One guy's a cab driver. He goes up to St. Peter and he says, hey, is it, am I allowed in? Is my name in the book? And St. Peter opens up the book and looks and says, hey, guess what? Your name, your name is here. He raises his eyebrows. He's like, wow. He says to the cab driver, he says, come on over here for a minute. I've got this nice robe for you and this golden staff. And St. Peter walks up right through the gates. There's a minister standing right behind the cab driver going, wow, if this guy gets this treatment, what am I going to get? And he goes to St. Peter and says, St. Peter, is my name written in the book? St. Peter looks at the book and he rubs his forehead and he squints his eyes and he says, well, you get that wooden staff and uh, you can wear what you're wearing. You can go on in. And the minister's like, wait a minute. I preached my whole life the message of the gospel. Uh, how come a cab driver gets a golden staff and a robe? Hi. And I only get a wooden staff and I have to wear what I've got. He said, well, Pastor... When you preach, people fell asleep. When the cab driver drove, they prayed. Anyone hear that one before? All right. We're all going to stand before God one day. We're all going to stand before God, and he's going to open the book, and he's going to ask us, is your name written there? You know, our Heavenly Father loves His children, you and I. And most of the time, that love is more than enough for each of us. It's enough for us to follow Him because we recognize that we are sons and daughters of the King of Kings, that He loves us unconditionally, that Jesus, when we believe in Him, we are forgiven and set free, that there's healing available. Many of you have experienced that both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You can testify to the fact that God loves you. And when this minister here starts talking about hell, we have to recognize that God loves us, and yet sometimes we need to know that if we stray too far, we don't make up our minds for Jesus. There is another place waiting. You see, God just simply honors our choice. He said, you choose. I want to lay out for you the, the message of Jesus. That Jesus said that we are sinful in need of saving. He said, I, I've come to save, to seek and save that which is lost. He said, I, I want you to follow me, not because you have to, not because uh, I'm making you, or because it's the right thing. I want you to follow because you believe that there's forgiveness and healing in the name of Jesus. You choose. But remember that God is on his throne and the devil needs his permission. Needs his permission to do what he does in your life. That God is in control. The devil still has to ask. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, the devil, the Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Satan has asked to slap you upside the head and see what you're going to do. <laughs> but he had to ask. So when the devil is going strong in through the lives of the people in your life, in the world that we live, maybe even uh, running havoc in your own life, remember that God is still in control and that sometimes he uses the devil for his good. You know what? We, I kind of get this icky feeling in my stomach when I say stuff like that because I know that some of you don't believe me that why would God use the devil to, to carry out the kingdom of God? Well, much like I would let my child fail, 
to not succeed, that I would allow it to happen, that I wouldn't step in front and plow away all the problems that my child would have because they need to come up against the adversity in this life to recognize that mom and dad love them and care for them and that they have a home no matter what and that I think sometimes the adversity in your life and mine God uses to shape us into the godly people that we are. He makes us and shapes us through our adversities. But remember that the devil (laughs) is going to be thrown into the lake of fire and harassed and tormented every day. When I think about those evil people in the world who have done such damage, when I think of the, uh, the, the people in this world who have let evil reign, I'm grateful for a God who says there is There is a time and place when they will receive what they deserve. But I'm also really, really grateful that God loves me enough to remove all of that from my life and say, I will go with you through the gates, in through the pearly gates, to this heaven that awaits. A heaven that I talked to you last time about where there is no more pain, where there is no more evil, where there is no more Satan, where God's glory reigns, his kingdom has come, his will is being done, and we glorify his name because he is good, and he loves us, and he says, welcome home. Let me pray for you, because some of you are going through some of the darkest things that you've experienced in a long time. Some of you are stuck in your relationship with God. Some of you are are waiting to hear from God in a way that kind of moves you forward. And I want to pray into that in this moment as the band comes back up here. I want to ask you to pray with me. That God might be here with you and lead you. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the support that you give us. Recognizing that there is a time and a place when the evil in this world will be punished. Because oftentimes, Lord, in my world and in the world around us, it seems like evil gets away with it. Thank you, God, that those who have done harm to us will receive what they are deserving of. But Lord, I pray that you would reach into their heart just like you reached into mine, that you would transform that heart, even that evil person, that that you would make that person new, that you would bring about salvation and glory and turn this into good for them. Father, would you use those things in our life uh, to bring about good? And if you're struggling right now about this whole Jesus thing, I want you to trust that Jesus knows what he's doing and that he offers you salvation in this moment. I pray, Lord, for your blessing on us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen.